Good afternoon and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to this, the second webinar uh, that is run by NetBank, EE Business Intelligence, and the Joe Beck Center for Software Engineering at VET. Today is the 18th of September, 2020, and we are so excited to have you on board, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for, again for joining us in this series of webinars that we are bringing to you. My name is Tavan Chilwani, the Executive Head of Group Strategic Relations and Public Affairs at NetBank. I will be your co-host today, along with Prof. Barry Dulaski, founder of the Joe Beck Center for Software Engineering and the Tsimulohong Digital Innovation Precinct of Wirtz University. We are also looking forward to the participation of the Ministry of Communication and the Digital Technologies this afternoon. Back in 2015, more than half the planet did not have um, access to network connectivity. In countries like South Africa, more than 90% of all households did not have home-based internet access. Those supporting the Global Connectivity Declaration see how critical digital literacy and le uh, leadership is to the growing divide facing not only South Africa, but in all civil societies around the, uh, the world. Since then, there's been a lot of progress. Internet penetration levels are at all time high, yet more than 25% of the world's population has inadequate access to, active, uh, to actively participate in the mid-century global internet in economy. Again, millions in the cities across South Africa, and indeed in most parts of the world, including developed countries do not have real broadband connectivity as defined by experts. More urgent and worrisome is that the gap is growing and not narrowing. While the internet underclass have increasingly had better access and service options in the past decade or so, the elite internet technocracy opportunities and consumption patterns have grown exponentially for the past three decades. This means that those with access to fast internet are able to leverage the most advanced health, education, and cultural experiences, which are now available to only the most elite, while the growing digital underclass is left behind due to this unequal te uh, technological development. Simply put, this digital divide exacerbates the already huge gap between the haves and the haves not. This gap means access to good education and ultimately better career options. This is rather worrisome for a country endowed with so many young people. So today at NetBank, we at NetBank in association with EE Business Intelligence and the Joe Beck Center for Software Engineering at VETS are hosting this dialogue on narrowing the digital divide to provide available and affordable internet access for all South Africans. At this point, I wish to welcome the Minister of uh, Communications and Digital Technologies, Ms. Stella Ndaveni Abrahams. Ms. Abraham, Ndaveni Abrahams is the Minister of Communications and Digital Technologies responsible for, exec for executive oversight over the Department of Communications and Digital Technologies. The minister is well versed on issues pert uh, pertaining to ICT convergence and digital transformation, understanding that for South Africa to uh, appropriately position itself for the fourth industrial revolution, skills development and capacity building for young entrepreneurs, uh, government of uh, employees and citizens must be at the helm of all interventions. To this end, the minister has been at the forefront of building a capable 4IR army. As the then Deputy Minister of Telecommunications and Postal Services, she led the launch of the 4th IR Skills Forum, an initiative that seeks to harmonize efforts of all stakeholders in the sector towards building a capable 4IR army. This, uh, this is done through in-school and post-school training. Uh, SMME development, infrastructure develop, uh, deployment, and innovation initiatives. Among the many accolades 
Minister Davini Abrams also ex extensively promoted the use of technology in schools based in rural and peri-urban areas. She played a pivotal role that re uh, resulted in the 2013 amend uh, amendment of mobile operators license obligation by a communications regulator ICASA, thus ensuring that uh, at least 4,500 rural schools receive cyber labs equipped with laptops and tablets with a 24-month internet connectivity, educational software and printing facilities. This was in addition to the 1,500 schools connected as a 2010 World Cup legacy. At this point in time, we'd like to invite Minister Ndabeni Abrahams to uh, have a keynote address with us, after which uh, Prof. Perry will take the program further. Minister, over to you. Good afternoon, Tabang, and thank you so much for affording me an opportunity to be with you. Uh, good afternoon to yourself and your co-host, esteemed guests, ladies and gentlemen. I am honored to address this critical gathering that is hosted by NADBank, which is a, sig a signatory to the contract for the web initiative. We're the father of almost all disciplines we study today, namely Aristotle, developed the model of communication. Little did he know that his genius would remain the point of reference until today, when communication has grown to be an essential ingredient of normal life. Nor did he imagine that the evolution of communication would reach a stage where today we talk about the Internet of Things, artificial intelligence, and all the sophistications of the fourth industrial revolution technologies. I am pleased to know that NetBank deemed it proper to join when World Wide Web Foundation launched the contract for the web in November 2019. Of the nine principles of the contract, I would limit myself and my remarks to principle four, which, which talks about uh, making the internet affordable and accessible to everyone. Launching the contract, Tim Benedley, the inventor of the World Wide Web said, and I quote, the power of the web to transform people's lives, enrich society and reduce inequality is one of the defining opportunities of our time. But if we don't act now and act together to prevent the web being misused by those who want to exploit, divide and undermine, we are at a risk of squandering that potential." Close quote. One of the motivating factors behind Tim Berners' lead drive to launch the contract is what he perceived as constant threat against the web from wrongdoers globally. The more the people of the world use the internet, the more exposed they are to this threat if collective effort is not made by people wherever they are. South Africa is no exception to this. According to the Stats SA General Household Survey, the proportion of households who use only cellular phones as a means of communication steadily increased to 89.5% in 2018. This shows greater reliance on cellular phones by households. At national level, the GHS reported that in 2018, the proportion of households with access to internet was at 64.7%, while more than half of about 60% of households nationally had access to the internet using mobile devices, with the majority of this access accounted for by households living in metropolitan areas, which sits at 67%. Mobile devices are also the most used means of accessing the internet by households in rural areas, nationally at 45%. Ladies and gentlemen, regarding broadband coverage, our authority, ICASA, reported that national population coverage for 3G increased from 99.5% in 2018 to 99.7% in 2019. On the other hand, national population coverage for 4G, or long-term evolution, which is known as LTE, increased from 85.7% in 2018 to 92.8% in 2019. Fiber to the home or building, internet subscriptions, 
increased by 28.8% in 2019 to over 1.6 million subscriptions. For a period of five years, fixed broadband subscriptions increased significantly by 29.4%. Over the same period, fiber to the home, internet subscriptions increased by 168.2%. As I'm speaking to you now, the fiber infrastructure is being rolled out primarily in major metropolitan areas. South Africa has abundant international internet bandwidth capacity. The capacity has increased by 36.3% in 2019. The constraints remain largely on the last mile access. What concerns me most is that the expansion of high-speed fiber infrastructure into rural areas is noticeably lagging behind. An occasion like this serves as a reminder that at no stage should cybersecurity be taken for granted. COVID has exposed us to the realities of the challenges that we are faced with. As much as we talk about the fiber to the home, fiber to the building, and the mobile connectivity, but the reality sank when did the government try to introduce digital services to those that had to remain productive in their areas of comfort in their homes. Those that migrated from the suburbia going to their rural areas, it then exposed that as much as we can be given all the stats on population coverage, but there's still more that needs to be done on geographical coverage so as to ensure that whether you walk by the river or by the milli fields, you are able to communicate and can do what you need to do. As we look at international benchmarks, according to UCLA, the global speed test ranking for South Africa was at 78 out of 174 for fixed broadband and 55 out of 138 for mobile broadband in July 2020, indicative of globally competitive broadband speeds. I've spoken about the speeds as I made reference to what COVID has shown us in terms of realities that it has been proven that it is not enough which is why you have seen the ministry working with the authority ensuring that in order to make sure that we provide in efficient service, uh, we then avail temporal spectrum to the operators. We therefore had to leverage on certain interventions as to avoid infrastructure, but ensure remote working. As I talk about temporal spectrum that was availed, I'm going to get into the investment that has been made in the infrastructure, not by government, but by the entire industry. And as I conclude on that, I will be making reference to what government has done. In 2019, about 38 billion was invested in the telecommunications industry to improve internet access. Ladies and gentlemen, in a country like ours, where every aspect of life is color zoned, and characterized by a great divide between the rural and urban areas, technological advancement should be used to leapfrog those areas that are left behind. It is in this context that I implore all stakeholders in the industry to work together in shaping up a South Africa we will all be proud of. The corporate, government, and civil society must work together to eliminate the digital divide. In this regard, there are baby steps worth noting. A good example has been set by the country's two largest mobile operators, Vodacom and MTN, who cut their mobile data prices by up to 20% and to 50%. It must, however, be noted that this was done not in response to COVID-19, but following a two-year investigation that was commissioned by the department through the Competition Commission into the high mobile data costs, which hammered access for many citizens. Most service providers have zero-rated many learning sites, meaning that they can be accessed for free. We have about more than 500 sites, again, that are targeting SMMEs that have been zero-rated, Many fiber providers in the country also upgraded the speed of the customers' lines during the lockdown, although this will primarily benefit those in the higher socioeconomic bracket. In ensuring that digital divide between urban and rural communities is bridged, government is currently implementing the National Broad Poli Broadband Policy, which is popularly known as SA Connect. 
The first phase of the project had prioritized the connectivity of the 970 government facilities, healthcare and schools in the underserved eight identified district municipalities. And the department is currently conducting a feasibility study for funding SA Connect phase two, which would cover the rest of the country. This study is due to be completed by 2020, and it is envisaged that this will result in cost-effective and efficient broadband rollout models and funding mechanisms. You may be asking yourself, why would it take this long to undertake a feasibility study? But as I had said, from COVID, we have learned some lessons. It has exposed us there to the realities that we are faced with, that as we had in the face phase, focus on government buildings that people may not have access to those. Students may not have access to schools, and therefore it becomes crucial that we take services where people are at. That is why the second phase will be looking at bringing connectivity to where people are. If it means home, let it be brought home. And that's one initiative that will be driven by the private sector as we fully appreciate the economic state of the country that we live in, but appreciate also the capability of the industry that we have that can invest more and ours as government will be to create an enabling environment, including incentives that must be deployed in order to make sure that infrastructure covers all. On rapid deployment of infrastructure, we have developed a rapid deployment policy as required under Section 22 of the Electronic Communications Act uh, which has taken longer than we anticipated. You may have colleagues uh, read or received emails that were saying Stella and Benny Abrams uh, invite companies to come and put towers without the permission of the property owners. I want to employ you to go and read the policy so that you can take comfort in the fact that as the ANC government and therefore the ministry we do recognize the importance of people's rights. There is no way that we can undermine property owners' rights. Everything that we detailed in the policy is done in consultation with all stakeholders that are involved. Practical steps have, however, been taken to establish a rapid deployment coordinating committee and to develop the required relationship with the Department of COCTA and the South African Local Government Association. The need to coordinate the deployment of electronic communications networks proved to be an imperative in the face of the COVID-19, as so many stringent processes needed to be undertaken before people deploy the infrastructure. I once more call upon all stakeholders to work collaboratively for the common good. The fourth industrial revolution is an era of collaboration, solidarity, and Ubuntu. Experience has shown us that none of us acting in isolation will win the battle of survival in the fourth industrial revolution. Co-hosts, it is because of this reason and this dedication to that important collaboration that we need to have with all stakeholders that are involved that today we are very grateful to be part of, of, of the initiative that we have started. As I conclude once more, I want to say we have not done much. COVID has really exposed us to that reality, but we believe that working together, we can do more in order to make sure that we connect the 20 million unconnected people of South Africa. Our authority, ICASA, is in a process of licensing spectrum, which will also assist us in bridging that digital divide and expand, including attending to the issue of the cost to communicate. Immediately after our meeting with the authority, we'll then appraise all stakeholders of the processes and the timeframes that we are expecting. Ladies and gentlemen, allow me to say the ANC government loves you all. South Africa awaits your contribution. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Minister, for that um, um, very illuminating and very clear picture of what's what your um, your strategy is and what the uh, government is doing in um, in this post-COVID new reality, and we have identified and everyone's seen how um, the 
a bright spotlight has been put onto the digital divide. And we know that we are a country of haves and have nots. And in the digital space, as we go forward into digital transformation and the fourth industrial revolution, we are very aware that we've, we've got a lot of uh, gaps to fill. Uh, the panel that we've put uh, together for this um, uh, webinar is um, a panel that um, clearly represents what's called the triple helix. We've got research and, acad uh, research and academia, we've got the corporates and we've got government around the table. And I think, as you said, Minister, it's about partnerships. It's about bringing together those three parties. So our first speaker who will try to set uh, the scene in terms of research that he's done and who will um, give us an up-to-date picture of what is out there is, and it's a great privilege to have Arthur Goldstuck, who is the Managing Director of Worldwide Works. Um, Arthur's a, he's a best known, I suppose, as a journalist and writer. He's a media analyst and a, and a commentator on the ICT sector. He um, is well informed and also has uh, done a lot of research on mobile communications, the internet, and a whole range of ICT related topics. He heads Worldwide Works, which is a research organization, and it has uh, done um, a lot of work on deep analysis of the effects of IT on small business, on the role of mobile technologies in business and government, and the technology challenges of the financial services sector. He regularly provides strategic insights and guidance on trends at conferences and corporate events across Africa. So uh, welcome, Arthur, and if I can hand over to you. Thank you very much, Professor Wolowski. Thank you, Minister, and thank you to NetBank for hosting uh, this event. Uh, much appreciated. I'm going to share some of the research that we've conducted, but I'm going to put it in the context of a narrative. And that narrative is um, around the many digital divides of our society. There isn't one digital divide. It's not only about whether you have access to broadband or not, although that is a critical element of it. I'm first going to give you a bit of a history lesson, take you into the past and what history saw as the future. And why I tell this story is to show that none of the demand that we see today should be a surprise whether it's COVID-19 or whether it's other circumstances. This is how education was viewed in the year 1900. They expected by 2000 that all textbooks would be digitized and fed directly into students' brains. Well, the first part happened. The second part seems to happen when you look at remote learning, but probably the full extent of this vision is still a few decades away. But to some extent, the idea of digitalized education or digitized education was already uh, with us. Entertainment as seen in cards put into chocolate boxes in Germany in uh, the year 1900. A hundred years from now, they thought, entertainment would all be streamed. People would be able to sit in remote places and watch something that's performed elsewhere. And that is exactly what is happening now, except that we don't have to dress up to go watching streamed video. This was socializing as seen in 1930, and they got it spot on, except for the exact shape of the devices. Don't be too surprised if someone comes up with that kind of format as they experiment with the various bizarre formats that we see in smartphones uh, today. And then from earlier this year, a vision of the future office. The funny thing is you have exactly those kind of pods in uh, business lounges at airports minus the virtual reality uh, part of it and that's how future remote working was perceived the reality is a little different this is 
the new office thanks to COVID-19 and uh, remote working. Uh, many people have not had to invest in new trousers for the past uh, six months, only shirts because that's what appears on uh, camera. Unless you're caught on the other side of the digital divide, all of those images of the future assume that everyone is part of the digital revolution and the reality is a little different. But first perspective on the great needs of society. And this is reflected in what people search for online. So what I've done is selected three proxies for entertainment, for productivity and for learning. So searches on Netflix reflect the quest for entertainment, searches on education reflect the quest for learning, and searches on Zoom reflect the quest for productivity and continuing working remotely. And you can see that spike in the graph about halfway through is when lockdown began. That was the last week of March. And you can see Netflix saw a massive spike. Zoom came from nowhere to overtake education, which always was a strong interest. And education only really spiked once schools were allowed to come out of a lockdown. But uh, what we see now is productivity declining as people get used to the new way of work. Entertainment declined slightly, but is on the rise again. And you can see entertainment exceeds the quest for both learning and for uh, productivity. But again, all three of these reflect the digital divide in the sense that the haves are able to search for these options and to indulge in these options. The have-nots, for them, this is a completely foreign graph. This, in a sense, reflects the South African picture for entertainment usage in the streaming world. This was Showmax uh, plays in the weeks following uh, lockdown or the two weeks following uh, the beginning of lockdown, where you see that massive spike uh, one and a half times the viewership that they had seen before lockdown came in the week or so um, after lockdown. Again, this reflects the ability of the digital haves to be able to deal with things like lockdown, to be able to have a coping mechanism provided by digital access. But without fiber or true 4G, the vision of streaming video that is well over 100 years old remains a future fantasy, remains a vision that can't be attained. Let me share some research that we've conducted around business use of technology to show a different kind of divide. We researched the use of cloud computing across eight African countries with Dell, Intel, F5 and DigiCloud supporting that research. So a very extensive project in which we interviewed 400 business decision makers. And what we found was that South Africa in the past year saw an 82% increase in spend on cloud. Across these African countries, the average was around 58%. Zambia saw no increase primarily due to the economic difficulties that are facing uh, that country. But you can see the dramatic increase in mostly business spending on cloud uh, computing. When we asked what the main benefits of accessing the cloud were, business efficiency came out clearly as number one, followed by agility or operational flexibility. And the interesting thing is when the UIF system was uh, taken down recently uh, after an assessment, the um, Auditor General reported that the main drawback of that system and other support systems to help people cope with uh, COVID-19 financial difficulties was lack of agility. And cloud is exactly what provides that agility. Now, I'll come back to that um, in a moment. Uh, we see several digital divides at work in this regard. The main business divide is in skills and resources to access the cloud, which means that startups or small businesses or entrepreneurs are in fact caught on the other side of a competitiveness divide. Those who can access the cloud and utilize it 
have a massive advantage and differentiator over those who can't. So this digital divide is one around competitiveness. Then we conducted research into remote working in South Africa. Uh, one of the first comprehensive studies uh, conducted on the topic with uh, Cisco Systems, we looked in the first two months of lockdown what the success factors were for remote working. And this is what we came up with. There were uh, four that really stood out above all other, and three of them were human factors. Better delegation of tasks, the support of the company for their workers, and allowing time uh, with children. But right alongside those was good connectivity in the home. So you could call this, as the, the, in, in summary, happy home, happy worker. And part of happy home and happy worker is having good connectivity. Again, this is for the haves. Stats SA did a, a study after the first um, month of lockdown in which they found that of those who have internet access, 73% were able to continue working from home. And the reason that they were able to continue was because they had connectivity at home. And this highlights the next divide, the worker divide. Without adequate connectivity at home, the uh, worker and the job seeker alike, the unemployed, are all at the mercy of the environment, of the elements of circumstance, as opposed to be able, uh, being able to take control of their own destiny. So connectivity allows you to control your destiny. You could almost call that the destiny divide. And then we asked in that survey, after the crisis is over, will you allow your employee, employees to work remotely? And 38% said yes. Now that 38% correlated directly with the organizations that were fully digitally transformed. Now, almost all companies that we surveyed were on the path to digital, digital transformation, but only 38% were fully there. And quite coincidentally, but probably predictably, 38% also said they will allow staff to continue working remotely afterwards. Then in our cloud survey, just hopping back to that server, we also asked where the cloud assisted businesses in coping with the crisis. And a massive 91% said it helped with disaster recovery, which is a proxy for business continuity. But behind that, and not far behind, 82% said remote working. So the cloud was the basis for continuing to work remotely, and therefore the basis for uh, not being caught on the wrong side of the digital divide. But then we asked where the cloud assisted government in coping with the crisis. And here we found that only 69%, still high, but well behind the 82% of businesses were able to continue with uh, remote working. And this reflects a digital divide in government as well. And it's really a digital transformation divide. Um, it tells us that the readiness for many futures is all about your ability to transform all your processes. And as we've seen, especially in the UIF debacle, the government itself is caught on the wrong side of this divide. We talk about the digital awakening, when organizations are able to embrace the digital way of work, when the people are able to work digitally, and when people start embracing e-commerce and the like. This is not about change, but about everyone being able to feel the change in the way they operate. And that's why we call it the digital awakening. But the digital awakening highlights the digital divide because it highlights the divide between those who can awaken digitally and those who cannot. This was a fascinating graph that uh, NetBank issued around uh, two months ago, where they showed the shift in footfall to uh, their banks and con contrasted 2019 with 2020. So the big shift in 2020 came with uh, lockdown and COVID-19, where there was a massive drop in footfall, and then it increased again slightly, but uh, to a much lower level than it was before. And what you're seeing now is, um, well, the last stats that they released was 60% of existing clients 
were going into the bank compared to 81% a year before. Now that represents a digital divide between those who are forced to go in, into the bank and those who cannot. You could almost call that a 60-40 digital divide. And this is a barometer of the digital divide facing much of the population. This is really the bottom line, that digital awakening is not a choice for our economy, for our society. It's a necessity to be able to embrace the new future. And it's, it's a necessity for all. And it's connectivity that is going to allow for that digital awakening. The many digital uh, divides are keeping much of the population from being digitally awake. Thank you very much. I'm next. Thank you very much, Arthur. Um, I'm struggling to find my unmute button there. Uh, I guess I was also stuck in some digital hole. Um, but thank you so much for a very riveting presentation there. And uh, I can tell you that the, the reason I bought new shirts is because the old one didn't fit. Um, the, the, the fridge was just too close. Next Doesn't up. Uh, to <laughs> yes, I think I would like to uh, welcome um, Dr. Lucille Abrahams uh, from the uh, from Red University's Link Center, who is the director there. Uh, Lucy Abrahams is the director at Link Center at VETS, as I just said, uh, building research on the digital innovation and how digital technologies in influence change. Uh, studies include digital skills gap analysis, digital government strategy, scaling up innovation in tech hubs, open access in scholarly publishing, open air research partnership, and a health e-service improvement uh, in Egypt, South Africa research partnership. Uh, Lucy convinced, uh, convinced their masters and PhD programs in the interdisciplinary digital knowledge economy studies and uh, short courses in disruptive technologies, digital operations and leadership and the cyber security uh, profession, uh, professional practice. She serves on the board of the TNET and on the evaluation and review reference group for the review of the National Research Foundation. Lucy is corresponding editor for the African Journal of Information and Communication, indexed in the CLO Citation Index. Um, Dr. Lucy, um, the, we are looking forward to your pre presentation. Over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Tabang. Uh, thank you very much to Prof. Barry for the invitation, uh, my fellow panel uh, panel members, uh, and our webinar audience for today. I want to talk about affordable connectivity from a perspective outside of the uh, the typical environment, I think, probably that we all live in. Um, as I'm sitting here, I'm wondering whether any of us attending the session today live in any of the, uh, let's call it, I, I was going to say outlying areas, and then I thought that that's not very polite to say that about someone. Um, but outside of the major cities of Cape Town, Johannesburg, uh, uh, and others. Uh, for example, a place like Saldana Bay, uh, along the west coast of um, the Western Cape, a uh, little bit windy, uh, low flat lying area, uh, and one can drive for uh, an hour or more. And in fact, as you drive further and further inland, uh, you find less and less um, physical infrastructure. Uh, the Wi-Fi infrastructure is definitely there, uh, but is it affordable? 
so if we think about uh, Saldana Bay in the 21st century, and I, I, again, I'm not sure how many of you have been to the port of Saldana Bay. Uh, there's a, an artist's diagram on the slide that is showing at the moment. Uh, and while that artist's diagram lies somewhere in the future, uh, Saldana Bay is working to change its status from a sleepy town, a small sleepy town with uh, not much of a port infrastructure to being a world-class free port. But what does that mean in connectivity terms? Uh, we can move to the next slide. In that kind of rural economic development context and in many similar contexts, uh, the SBIDZ in the next 10, 20 to 30 years will need oil and gas engineers, software programmers, physicists, chemists, nanoscientists, um, 3D printing specialists, dietitians, health tech producers, and innovators in energy and recycling. They will also need musicians, lovely restaurants, really good teachers and healthcare workers, all of whom should be digital bilingual. And they will all need high speed internet, not tomorrow, but now. So we're engaged in a project supported by the SBIDZ licensing company. The SBIDZ is the Saldana Bay Industrial Development Zone. So the SBIDZ licensing company is supporting a, a project, a large project to enable schools to enter the digital era. And in particular, a course currently running online. The course is called Applications in Dynamic Software for Secondary Mathematics Education. And the initial uh, week of the course was delivered in one of those wonderful venues, the Saldana Bay Protea by Marriott Hotel. I'll show you a photo of that in a moment. And uh, the second week of the course, is being delivered not in one week or five days, six hours per day, but online over the course of 10 weeks, uh, 90 minutes per week, with 18 teachers working from home or attending from home, and where the team of academics offering the course are located across Stellenbosch and Johannesburg. So we, we are in the same virtual classroom, if not in the same room. But in order to make this possible, despite the fact that the schools do have internet, uh, that would really, uh, it, 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 it's just a, I call it a pretend internet because it's not really access to the internet. So we all say, oh no, schools, let's look at the percentage of schools that have internet access. Let's look at the pins on a map. And we might fool ourselves that schools have internet connectivity, but they, like Arthur was saying, they don't have good enough connectivity to participate in an online course using dynamic software. So the SBIDZ licensing company bought everyone a dongle, uh, handed it over to them, and that is how we then run the course online. We can move to the next slide. Just a little minor visualization of the course I'm talking about, um, the particular digital tools we're using are GeoGebra and the Geometer Sketchpad and uh, Microsoft Excel. And we are teaching and learning because everybody, including the academics involved, are both teaching and learning simultaneously. Uh, we are 
teaching and learning dynamic algebra and dynamic geometry visualization software. And a very interesting thing happened in the first week. Uh, what happened in the first week was that the, the lecturer uh, from the University of Stellenbosch, who was actually sitting in her lounge at home, asked one of the teachers to request control of her screen which one of the teachers duly did and started to move their cursor around to show various features of, I think it was isosceles triangles. And I then said to someone, where is that cursor moving? And they said, on Erna's screen. Erna is the Stellenbosch academic. And I said, no, it's, it's not moving on Erna's screen. Where is the cursor moving? And they thought about it for a moment and they said, the cursor is moving in cyberspace. So when Prof. Barry asked me to speak about what it means, what connectivity means to a person, a consumer, a citizen, an employer. I could not think of a better example than that. Where is the cursor moving? That is what connectivity means to a teacher, a learner, to the West Coast Education District of the Western Cape Education Department, who in this case is the employer to the Saldana Bay Industrial Development Zone Licensing Company, who is desperately trying to build socio-economic development along that coastal area with the, the potential, but not necessarily the promise, to all those coastal dwellers uh, until you get to a point where you can no longer drive up the coast. But there, there are many coastal villages. There are many poor young people, young girls and boys in those coastal villages who want to see that cursor moving in cyberspace. We can move on to the next slide. Quick picture of uh, before lockdown. And we can move on to the next slide. A uh, little bit of an alphabet soup of what we are doing. Secondary mathematics, dynamic software, algebraic equations, online tutorials. We can move on to the next slide. And a professional development framework for digital learning. We have very large numbers of young people in schools, young people who will be the generation of 2020 to 2050. Um, and I, I think this is what connectivity should mean for all of us, uh, not just for the people in Saldana Bay. Um, or the people along the West Coast, or the SBIDZ, but for all of us, for NetBank, for the Department of Communications and Digital Technologies, this, this is our mission. This is our development mission. Uh, we can move to the next slide, which shows that while we are at the very, very early stages of transitioning beyond mere connectivity, there are barriers to that digital transition in schools, to that digital transformation of the learning process because of poor connectivity. And, and what is it that we have to build on top of the connectivity? We have to build education streaming services. 
we need to be able to do live streaming and asynchronous content streaming on everything from secondary mathematics to geography, history, music, arts, theater online, choirs online. That is what we need to think about in terms of e-education. Not simply, um, you'll excuse me for using this word, a few miserable pages of content online. We also need to think about the transition of the nature of a school. And let me use the example of the Saldana Bay context to suggest that. The tech hub environments that you see on the left hand side of the screen should be more what schools look like. Schools need to become to resemble tech hubs in certain ways for certain subjects, for certain parts of the curriculum, so that they can become closer to the sources of deployment of those educated young people who will not necessarily all be software development specialists, but if they are physicists, they have software development skills. If they are marine engineers, they have software development or 3D printing or laser cutting skills. In other words, in the future, everyone in the transition from school to work will need digital skills, including basic software design skills, or be able to participate in a software design, te uh, design team, talking about user needs, perhaps. That is what connectivity means. We can move on to the next slide. And you can pass over these two slides very quickly. It's just a sense of the detail of the short course we're doing. Very basic work in dynamic software. Uh, we can move on, we can skip over. These are just slides to, to briefly pique your interest uh, this is a, uh, if, if, are we looking at the slide or uh, certificate of competence? Faculty of Humanities, professional practice applications of dynamic software for secondary mathematics teachers. That certificate is what connectivity means, potentially. For thousands, well, maybe it's hundreds, but yeah, close to thousands of math teachers across the country. Not necessarily this certificate, but one like that. Uh, and we're getting close to the end of my presentation. I think this is the second last slide. The next slide, the one on transformative pedagogy. If I can just briefly draw your attention to, this is from the Department of Basic Education's professional, de uh, uh, professional Development Framework for Digital Learning. And they suggest four degrees of transformative pedagogy. The A version, where the teacher dominates and which is very much what we have now, we have passive learners. We don't need passive learners for the 21st century. We will not make it in the 21st century with passive learners. All the way through to category D, on the right hand side of the diagram. Learner driven creation based on complex thinking skills. Learners mostly engage in collaborative, self directed, and self regulated activities with the teacher as the facilitator. Knowledge is constructed by learners and applied in real life scenarios. So many of us will be watching the future Olympic Games and other major international sports events with a virtual reality perspective. I don't know if you've watched 
Eudo sports focus on, they're building something called a cube, which is a, a, a virtual reality cube in which uh, commentators from different parts of the world, they wouldn't necessarily be in the same city, but to the viewer, uh, we, we, we would observe them in the same city with our virtual reality uh, glasses, headsets. That is the world of education. That is what connectivity means to young people, to teachers, to future employers. Because without that kind of young person graduating from a trick, who is going to go into university and do data science and artificial intelligence embedded in drones? Who is going to do that? Or will we forever be importers of technology? And it all starts with connectivity. Next slide. Of course, this is just a short case study. There are applications in every area of economic and social activity, in precision agriculture, South Africa's agriculture needs to be precision agriculture. South Africa's healthcare needs to be AI-enabled, precision-focused cancer, cancer diagnosis. South Africa's digital manufacturing needs to, be, needs to incorporate simulation, 3D visualization, data analytics, and multiple collaborative digital tools. And of course, FinTech. Thank you very much for listening, and I hope we'll have some comments and interaction soon. Thank you. Back to you, Taban. I think it's back to me. Thank you so yes, much, sir. Lucy. Thanks oh, for that. Sorry. And it, oh, really, sorry. Uh, and it really gives us a lot of food for thought in terms of how education and everything else depends on connectivity and more than connectivity, it's fast and affordable connectivity for everyone. Um, I would now like to hand over to Mark Harris. Mark is um, currently the chief executive of a company called Ultron Nexus. It's a company that provides advanced uh, network design and operation to the public and private sector. Uh, Mark's um, uh, pedigree is really good. He was country general manager for many years for IBM South Africa. He was also IBM uh, vice president for business development in Middle East and Africa. Uh, he then joined Kahisa Media as the chief executive. So the kind of um, world of content is, is also very familiar to Mark. And um, I have to say as well, he's uh, served on many advisory uh, uh, committees and councils. He was on President Otaba Mbeki's advisory council on ICT. And he's also on my JCSE advisory board as the chairman and on the Timolokong um, precincts board. So thank you so much, Mark, for coming and joining us. And I hand over to you. Might have to Mark, just unmute. So, Mark, are you? I do. Yeah. 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 I do feel a little bit like you know I've heard some really good presentations with some deep thoughts, and I'm about to bring us all back down to the ground level. Unfortunately, uh, what I'm going to try and do is uh, we heard a lot about connectivity and how important it is. But I really want us to just open our minds and look at, you know, what we can do and how long this is going to take us in order to ensure that we don't create a digital divide. Now, we hear a lot of talk about broadband. And I'm, when I'm you sorry. look at. Could I just. Sorry, Barry. You are, in fact, not in a, a presentation mode. If you could just. Uh, you, you, your slides are being shared, but they're not. Uh, full screen. 
that better? Very That's perfect, that Mark. Better? Okay, so, so, so when you look at the issue around broadband, and I heard a lot of talk about connectivity, um, I think there's some very basics that we need to understand about why this is so important. So you'll see that, first of all, when government thinks about broadband, when society thinks about broadband and connectivity, it's not a technical thing. I know that COVID sort of pushed us uh, into this environment, but on a global basis, it really is about the economic benefits. And some of the data behind that is actually quite scary, right? So they talk about a 1% growth in GDP where there is broadband penetration. And you'll see what that impact means uh, means to us. They say that for every 1,000 additional broadband users, there's about 80 new jobs get created. Um, so it really is about uh, broadband's not a techie thing. It's not about the, the mobile operators or the, the, the network operators. It's really about we as a society, what impact does this have on us? So if we look at the social benefits, and I think Lucy touched on some of this, um, we should really look to what we're going to do from an education point of view, because the use of technology and having the right connectivity will really have a huge impact and help to re reduce the type of divide that we're already starting to see. It will increase citizen participation in overall in the economy and the ability to interact and communicate in with government and with the rest of society. And then environmentally, it has a huge impact. So just smart grid, better management of our envir environment, the ability to track gas emissions, traffic control, et cetera. This is the type of impact that you would expect to see if you are able to address uh, the connectivity issues. But let's go forward. So if you look at broadband, so it's about job creation. Uh, you What you will find, it's about health records. And I think the interesting thing for me, specifically during the COVID period, is to see how some industries have quickly adapted. So, I mean, we all know what happened with education uh, and the fact that kids had to be educated at home. But we started to see impact in many other industries. I was sitting through something uh, through a Supreme Court appeal recently, and I was amazed that to see how those judges had quickly adopted to working in, in a digital environment. It was smooth, it was effective, and probably changed the nature of how court cases were done. But I think there will be no industry untouched, not just because of COVID, but as society starts to embrace this digital transformation, the type of impact and advantage it will have. But let's have a look at this connectivity and see what this means. So, of course, we have something called core networks. So I listened to the minister and it sounds Sounds really great, right? That uh, we are 97% is covered uh, if you look at 3G and hopefully from 4G. But unfortunately, that's not good enough to have the type of impact that we're going to see from a society point of view. So we've got to look at what does it mean? What does it mean to build this connectivity to reach all, all people in society and not necessarily have it exclusive to a few people? So if you look at the data, and you know, we, there's many different studies, et cetera, around what that means. But you will see collectively that DSL and fiber covers 12% of our household. Fiber connections to the home, which is they call uh, FTTH, is only about 6% of your home users have this uh, in their homes. And yes, uh, we've seen businesses having to step up dramatically in order to do it. But I always look at the lower income people and then three basic challenges. The first challenge they have is, yes, there may be 4G or 3G connectivity on their mobile phones, but they can't afford to use it for the type of impact that's required today. The second thing is they don't have the right access devices. And um, I was amazed to see how quickly government was reacting uh, to try and make those devices. And we see, even see it today, the rollout of devices that will help specifically education. And it's not just education, it's going to be across uh, most areas. And if you look at SIM cards as an example, so this is 3G in a tablet to PC, it's only about 8 to 10 percent, right? Um, so the connectivity for what we're going to require going forward is going to, is still going to be low, but the biggest issue is going to be around portability. So if you look at what that data looks like, ADSL is about, you know, 
uh, 1%, uh, 10% of our population. Mobile operators, yes, is high to the minister, can get you 93%. But if we look at uh, fiber to the home, average is about 6%. So the total broadband number does look good. But the reality is, especially for people in the lower income, they're just not going to be able to afford it. So we've seen a lot of um, initiatives. Uh, unfortunately, there is a view from uh, people involved in the telecoms industry and the ability for them. So they could, they could roll it and they've all contributed. We've seen as an example that universities example have had the ability to zero rate uh, the cost of data. We've seen the same with schools and that was in the COVID period, but there's a commercial reality about going forward. Who can afford <coughs> the type of connectivity that's going to be required? So there's a lot of things starting to happen, right? We see that um, metros are starting to build out fiber. They build out fiber for two reasons. One, for the effectiveness in government. The second thing is to, um, <coughs> is from a cost point of view. And then the third, which is the more difficult, is to make fiber and connectivity not just available to government, but also to society. And we have seen some initiatives which we call public WANs. Uh, so this is wide area networks and trying to create these hotspots. And it's expensive and it's difficult to do. So we're not going to reach the type of environment that we can. There was a very interesting story in, in Gauteng as an example where a community realized that if they wanted to be connected, they could go to the library in the area. And as long as they were close to the buildings, they could get free Wi-Fi. What is the messages from that is a couple of things. It basically says, especially in the, the poorer communities, that free Wi-Fi is critical to them, but the capability to roll it out in an environment that's going to have an impact on society is going to be difficult and it's going to take a long time before we're able to do it. But there's a lot of initiatives and the technology is continuously improving. And uh, thanks to the, the government, as an example, we also get in the cost of data, to, uh, which is continuously uh, decreasing. But it's of a long way away from where we would have uh, connectivity and broadband available to the bulk of society, as you've just seen from the previous chart, which I went through. So we are starting to do it. I heard Lucy talk about reaching out to the community centers, the to song centers to get them enabled. And each of the provinces right now are having to find lots of money in order to roll this type of connectivity uh, out to people's homes. Uh, we see a lot of uh, plays as an example, mainly commercial around satellite communications. And what the nice thing about satellite communications does, it's quick and easy to do, but the affordability for a lot of our households is still going to be an issue going to go forward. You've heard about something called TV white space as an example, which should be a low cost entry for a lot of people or ability to give people in the lower incomes access to connectivity, uh, but it doesn't have the stability required to be able to help from a schooling point of view from an education point of view and to help our people so that this digital vibe doesn't get bigger. But it's things we can do in order to improve and to speed the rate at which we can deliver communi a communication to a large part of society. So when we look at the, <coughs> the penetration on a provincial level um, around what is the percentages in the Eastern Cape? And I think that's where it's scary, right? So people <coughs> who earn up to 5,000 Rand a month, the coverage there is about 2.7%. Uh, higher than that, it gets up to 12, and then more than 20,000 Rand a month is about 26% of households have internet. Um, if you look at the free state, I'm not gonna go through every single province, but the point you can see, which is common across there, is for the bulk of our society, we're gonna have about 3.7 or up to 18.4% of our population and households being able to afford the rate of connectivity. Now, unfortunately, there's a caveat to this because when the telco operators look at how they're going to roll out, um, whether it's fiber or whether it's uh, something called 5G to people, they're going to concentrate on a couple of things. The first is where is the density in the population that it makes sense to make the investments to roll it out to that particular uh, demographics in that environment 
And then the second thing, unfortunately, is who can afford it, right? So when we look at the connectivity today, the level of affordability will remain a challenge. And unfortunately, government's really going to have to step up to help us to overcome that particular issue. Um, if we look at the uh, rural connectivity in the provinces, it's 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 scary. Uh, um, so if you look at it as an example, in the Eastern Cape, they've got 5,290 schools. And for uh, and this is even before thinking about COVID. It's about 570 of those schools which actually has access. And it's just a reality that it is going to be uh, where the kids who have uh, higher income homes, um, they will start to have access uh, to connectivity. I had an example recently, which was, you know, which so we can create a lot of hype around, you know, we've got e-learning at schools, the kids are, the teachers are using, but this digital divide has been even widened because of this particular scenario. So here was a school, sort of a middle income uh, type of school. It's a public school where based on COVID, they said, OK, they'll send work plans to kids. So this is no video conferencing, no e-learning systems, but at least they could send work plans. And a large portion of that particular school's parents came back to the school and said, you can't do this. You know, creating this divide because we don't have internet to even receive emails with the work plans. So we want everyone to come back into the school to actually collect it so it can even it out. So yes, you know, the COVID thing has driven and I think the online learning has been fantastic. I just fear that when you go look at the impact it's actually had on a large part of our population, the divide has actually increased rather than us being able to use the situation in order to improve it. And uh, things like zero rating, et cetera, is fantastic. Um, the reality is it won't be there forever. What you will find is that as soon as we're out of a certain phase, it's the affordability issue will again be something that we're going to have to address uh, going forward. So if we look at provincial connectivity in the last five years, what you will see every single project, uh, uh, every single province is looking about how they can quickly try to provide connectivity because they've realized how important connectivity, especially what Lucy said, is for society and especially specifically around education. And it's not cheap to do. So the Eastern Cape have, uh, are running a broadband project, uh, one to connect government, but also to do at school level. You see Free State, there's nothing in the from a budget point of view at the moment. You see Gauteng, there's two massive projects which they've uh, undertake, undertaken. We see uh, KZN and what uh, the minister spoke about. There is something called SA Connect, which is government saying we really need to put together a, a mechanism to try and roll connectivity out to the rural communities, because those are the people the hardest set. And, and it's hard, it's going to be expensive. Uh, the speed at which we can do it hopefully will not create the type of divide which we're starting to see uh, already. Limpopo is busy with a, a project through some through the Economic Development Agency to try and address it. And the fiber rollout is, a, is, is happening um, there already. There's a Mpumalanga is looking at a broadband project uh, in the Northwest province. They're looking at it, nothing in the Northern Cape. And then the Western Cape, of course, is, um, is uh, rolling out a project, uh, so a lot of work still be, to be done. I think the key thing, none of these provinces are there yet. Uh, there are massive projects underway. There's a lot of money being spent, but it's going to take us a while until uh, we reach the type of uh, access that's going to help us to roll out the type of new the digital economy and the 4IRR economy uh, to all parts of our population so that no one gets left behind as well. So when you look at why, so, so why are these problems doing it? So first of all, there's about government, government efficiency. So forget about reaching to the home of our poorer communities, but to get government uh, departments hooked up, there's a lot of these projects that's been done in order to achieve that. As an economic enabler, it is critical. So, you know, I can go, you know, and talk about all the other things about startups and incubation and innovation, and all these great applications that can be developed by people. We can talk about skills and the way people need to get there, but the data shows that it's an imperative uh, from an economic enabler point of view. 
from a knowledge creation point of view, it's just huge, right? So if you look at the impact uh, connectivity will have on society overall, just improving the skills and education of individuals through the use of broadband um, services, that alone almost justifies the rate of investment uh, in order to do it. And then, um, you know, fortunately, we do have leaders in this country who keeps looking at universal access and saying, you know, it's nice that we can do this and the telcos are there and we've got corporates doing this and some of the, the, the better of the schools who can afford it is rolling out um, is rolling out e-learning. But it's really important that there has to be digital inclusion so that this broadband access for everyone, which will enable new responses to the socioeconomic uh, situation which we as a country find ourselves in. So, so while this looks very complex and there's a lot of things, I think there's a couple of key points behind what I've just showed you. So one, uh, governments trying to react as fast as they as they can. The second thing which is important is the length of time um, it's going to take to ensure that the digital divide does not occur and there is digital inclusion and no one gets left behind. The third, the technology is improving. So, and the costs are coming down, and I think government has to keep the type of pressure on the telcos to continuously uh, 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 reduce the cost because there are still a lot of people who can't afford it. The access devices have to be resolved. So we see government trying to do things in order to ensure that especially in lower income families, that at least the kids have the right devices, because many of them are walking around with function phones, which is not really going to help, and they, however, cannot afford data, especially in the typical environment that they have data now. So this country has to change in the way we roll out, whether it's Wi-Fi environment, it's broadband to the home, whether it's through the schools or through other uh, facilities to ensure that the kids have access to Wi-Fi so that they can connect and they can access the type of resources that will help us to grow society overall. So as a country, we've got a lot of challenges, as I showed you. There's quite a lot of projects that's starting to help. There is no magic bullet. There is no magic bullet. Um, the investments have to continue. Uh, government has to keep this focus. It is so essential, um, as I've tried to explain to you, uh, for our economy and to ensure that we don't have this digital uh, separation again, that we allow all parts of our society to participate. Because as Lucy showed you, going forward, uh, that's what the world's going to look like. Whether we're talking about jobs, whether we're talking about skills, whether we're talking about new enterprises or startups, the digital economy relies on connectivity. And unless we address it from a very young age with all our kids, once again, there'll be the people who had access to it sitting in the top end of the economy and the bulk of our people sitting in the lower end of the economy because they just weren't put uh, given the access given the connectivity and given the skills to actively participate in this new 4IR area, which is right upon us. I thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Very thank you very much uh, um, for the intriguing um, presentation um, that we've just uh, heard from you, Mark. Um, they, you've given us a lot to think about. Uh, indeed, um, there are a lot of questions also coming on the side, and uh, we would like to encourage uh, everybody who's watching to post your questions on the in the link, and uh, we shall try to address them um, during the question and answer session that we'll go through uh, into in, in the next few moments. It is also my pleasure now to introduce last but not least of our panelists, uh, Mr. Lance Williams, who is the executive for the infrastructure at the State Information Technology Agency, CETA, with over 24 years of experience in the ICT sector. Having obtained an information systems honors degree and bachelor's of commerce degree from the University of Cape Town, um, William spent nine years in the private sector specializing in financial services before transitioning into the public sector. He has over 12 years of experience as a CIO in the public sector and was appointed as an a, executive at CETA in 2018. A humanitarian as well as an IT visionary, he has served on the United Nations Disaster Assessment and Coordination Board 
chaired the National Disaster Management Advisory Forum, co-chaired the Working on Fire Program, and was a South African re government representative to the United Nations in respect of disaster management. He has also served on the board of the South African Weather Service. We are delighted to have you as a panelist, uh, and uh, Lance, we'd like to hand over to you for your presentation. Uh, Taban, thank you very much. Um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, fellow uh, panel members, minister, thank you for the opportunity. I'm excited to be participating uh, this afternoon. Um, the panel members have made it quite difficult for, uh, for me. They've done an excellent job of sharing the, the problem statement, um, identifying the potential opportunities um, for how to address the problem statement. Uh, I think it's perhaps useful to start off with a, a bit of an anecdote. And um, as CETA, obviously responsible for providing services to all of government at the uh, outset with uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, we were immediately uh, tasked uh, with doing a few critical things. First and foremost, providing connectivity to our key stakeholders, um, both mobile and fixed connectivity. We were tasked with um, increasing internet bandwidth for our government stakeholders. Uh, we were tasked with um, ensuring that um, uh, the connectivity could scale and uh, there was an immediate uptick in the demand for our cloud-based services. So that uh, probably emphasizes the fact and the anecdotes that you hear about uh, COVID-19 doing more for ICTs in the private and public sector than many CIOs, CTOs, CDOs have uh, in fact done. So from, from that perspective, I think it's been a reality check, but it has present, uh, presented a set of opportunities for us. Um, the problem statement, uh, and I'm going to move very quickly through these. I think they're well understood. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic will have a fundamental impact on uh, the economy. Uh, the resource envelope is constrained across the three spheres of government, state-owned entities, state-owned companies, CapEx and OpEx budgets have either been cut already or will co continue to be placed under pressure as we rightfully focus on health and education outcomes. Uh, we've typically followed a fragmented approach to conceptualizing and implementing broadband solutions. So we've solved part of the problem statement, but we've not managed to solve the fundamental issue, which is this notion of ubiquitous internet available uh, for all at, a, at an affordable price point. Uh, we focused a lot on infrastructure and technology. We don't focus enough on change management, capacitation, skills development, and optimizing business processes. So we, we chase the cool things, but we don't necessarily address the broader problem statement. Uh, there's been a, a real focus on owning infrastructure as opposed to evolving to service-based models. And I'll come back to that a little bit later. And as the minister mentioned right at the outset, very limited progress made in addressing broadband and internet needs in the rural and deep rural areas. And I think uh, for us, that's a fundamental concern. The minister made mention of SA Connect, and I'll circle back to that. Uh, other than that, there's been really limited um, interventions where we needed most. And I think quite a limited approach towards using partnerships and risk sharing models to um, fast track the agenda to provide connectivity where it's needed most. The opportunity, once again, I think this has been touched on. Um, numerous studies indicating the uh, positive uh, economic and social impact that the broadband investment has on communities and the economy. So the, the direct link between GDP growth and investment in broadband is well understood. Uh, key areas that could derive benefit from broadband. I think we've touched on education and I've uh, program director just added in a few slides on the education side because I think it's uh, an incredibly important problem statement that we need to address. Healthcare, connected citizens, safety and security, rural business, uh, there, there was mention made of agriculture. And uh, we, we can't underestimate the impact that the investment in broadband infrastructure has on the ability of individuals, businesses, or communities to generate income. So it's really about access to opportunities. Uh, so the four-hour opportunity, once again, the minister made reference to this um, at the outset in a keynote. 
Uh, without the technology enablers, um, we are always going to be constrained and uh, the fundamental building block to the economy is inevitably our enabling infrastructure. And if we are going to be um, using this opportunity as a catalyst to drive uh, the economy and uh, empower digital growth and ensure that we are enabled so that if we do have um, what we've experienced over the last six months, again, that we are in a better position to respond. So the obvious questions are, how do we then narrow the digital divide? Um, first and foremost, I'm a big proponent of having unifying strategies and plans. I, I think we do need to have an ambitious uh, strategy plan and vision and uh, clearly coordinating and to state the obvious, I'm focusing on a, a government and public sector perspective to coordinate and integrate government action to improve the provision of telecommunication infrastructure skills and usage. So not dealing with infrastructure as the only element, but at the same time, right from the architecture and design, think through skills and uptake and usage. I think having a clear vision, uh, so folk, and, and not necessarily focusing on our corporate offices. So we, we've got reasonable broadband connectivity to government sites. But if we are clear about who the end consumer potentially could be, and we start focusing on addressing the last mile, as the minister had mentioned, to citizens in towns and villages, then how do we utilize the opportunity to, as we connect ourselves as the administration, uh, close the last mile gap to the communities that we serve and we ultimately need to, to address? Um, I think it's important to, to just state that the National Development Plan makes reference to a dynamic and connected information society and a knowledge economy that is inclusive. We mustn't lose sight of that. SA Connect, uh, which the Minister referred to, the provision of affordable, ubiquitous broadband to meet the diverse needs of public and private users. And it's based on a few key tenets, and I'm going to keep mentioning these. It's about aggregation of demand. It's about government serving as an anchor tenant. We need our uh, sites connected and we need internet, but at the same time, by aggregating demand, we create an incentive for the private sector to invest and utilize your strong balance sheets uh, and CapEx and OpEx that you've got available to help us address the broader problem statement. Um, we need to think through the whole notion of unified comms. So it's not just about a data link, it's about a voice and video and of course uh, we need to ensure that we at all times are getting closer to the deep rural areas. Now the partnership between government and private sector, so, so it, it's quite likely that with a constrained resource environment you're going to find that more we will shift to shared risk models. Um, so as opposed to doing what we've done historically which is to say we've got five sites in the locality, please provide connectivity. We do a situational analysis and we say, well, actually we need 2000 sites connected and we are not going to do it over a two year period. We uh, will make the time span five to 10 years and that should provide sufficient incentive through aggregation of demand for private sector to price the solutions more effectively, but also to create an incentive to get the enabling infrastructure into uh, the deep rural areas. So within the Western Cape, as the earlier presenter Dr. Abrams had mentioned, uh, you don't need to go more than 30 kilometers from Cape Town CBD and there's very little connectivity, depending which way you're going, and I'm not referring to going into the ocean. So, so I think from that perspective, we do, as we uh, serve as anchor tenant, aggregate demand, create the incentive for private sector, the anticipation would be that you would be more likely to invest in areas that perhaps were not commercially uh, sustainable or viable historically. And at the same time, partner with SMMEs, QSEs, EMEs to ensure that we're building out the economy, growing small businesses, investing in local economies, and um, ultimately uh, creating a self-sustaining ecosystem. So, so uh, and, and ultimately that will um, address the key enabling infrastructure so that we can get on with the digital transformation agenda and particularly from a health and education perspective. So, so this is just a, a conceptual view. I think if we then deal with uh, the provision of broadband to government sites as enabling infrastructure, you then cascade it out somewhat. So you then say if you 
I have 2,000 sites and 1,300 or sc or schools. Why not create public Wi-Fi hotspots um, so that you get uh, the last mile addressed, albeit um, perhaps not at an enterprise grade level, but at least you're getting the point of access closer. Uh, Stream 3 applications, um, broadband is fantastic, but it's really about with its educational solutions or a hospital information system. Ultimately, uh, we need to utilize applications and solutions to get to a point where we can utilize data effectively. Um, and utilize that to inform policymakers to um, improve decision making. So this whole notion of data or evidence-based decision making. So it's a self-sustaining ecosystem, but premised on getting the enabling infrastructure in place, getting the apps and solutions in place and ensuring that we've got data that we can harvest and make informed decisions. So, so uh, program director, I'm not going to focus too much on the lessons learned. I think uh, the key points and takeaways, the need for partnerships. Um, we, we can achieve our own organizational goals, but I think if we're smart about things, we can partner with each other and uh, have far more impact. I think let's put a lot of emphasis on planning. Um, everything from way leave approvals and so Mark can tell you stories about how difficult the planning process is, but we've got to get got, we've got to get that right. Stakeholder management, both politically, administratively, it's. Uh, critically important that timely, accurate and meaningful information is made available to our stakeholders. Change navigation, uh, technology, I think it's been stated, is the easy bit. We've got to focus on people, capacitation skills and improving our business processes. Uh, Mark has just made the point, last mile medium flexibility, we often insist on fibre. Uh, if you've got to get fibre to a site 50 kilometres away, it's horrendously expensive and slow. So I think we need to be quite innovative about whether we're using point-to-point -point -point microwave, VSAT as a last resort, perhaps uh, going forward we can start looking at alternatives like 5G, but, but, but I think we need to be uh, mindful of uh, and be flexible with our requests and requirements for last mile uh, medium. And then learning lessons from uh, good practices. Um, uh, in Cape Town, it rains in winter. We don't often plan for that. Uh, if you are going to deploy ICT infrastructure in schools, the school schools close for extended periods of times in the holidays. So these are things that I think we've learned good lessons historically. And I think uh, just to start concluding, the, we need to see broadband and internet for what it is. So it's potentially a game changer. And I think it was well articulated by the other presenters. Uh, but it's really a means to an end. And I think the, the end has either got to be, and think of the government pinnacle outcomes. So whether it's improving education outcomes, health outcomes, that's when broadband becomes a, a game changer. Uh, just as, as you were introducing me, Chair, I've just pulled in this slide. Um, once again, I think if you look at the left, it's access. So get the enabling infrastructure in place. So this is an educational ecosystem. Once that is done, or concurrently, you've got to get the infrastructure into a school. Uh, that doesn't make much sense if you're not taking the teachers or the educators along with you. So the capacitation around that. And then, of course, ultimately ensuring that uh, and, and because once again, if there's not, it's, it's about getting to the Internet, it's about sharing and creating content um, without moving towards that direction where as government, once again, we, through our requirements, we can share risk with the private sector, uh, and, and this is possible and it's been done. I think, uh, and, and these aren't going to come through very clearly, but uh, I've literally just taken Worcester in the Western Cape as an example of what can be done if we plan correctly. So the yellow sites here are the mun municipal sites within literally a one square kilometer block. If you then add in a post office, the green block, if you add in the police station, the red um, star, uh, if you then, and literally, if you overlay all of the government facilities within a locality, you do get to the point uh, where you, as opposed to going out for two or three sites to get connectivity, you could say for this particular locality, uh, provide connectivity uh, for a meaningful period of time, but the anticipation is that um, private sector, we want a compelling price point. So government will aggregate its demand, you provide the solution and ultimately we get to focus on the outcomes uh, that are important for government. So whether it's healthcare, education, safety and security and the private sector gets to do what you're good at. And I think this is a mutually uh, beneficial approach 
to addressing the problem statement that we've discussed this morning. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lance. Um, I think that was very informative and a very useful presentation. Uh, we were going to take a short break, but because we're finishing by um, 2.30, we um, will uh, go straight into questions. And we've got quite a lot of questions that are stacked up already. And can I just encourage everyone? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of getting some um, um, kind of hit back in terms of the uh, the break. So maybe um, I know that the minister is still with us, and I wonder if we can just ask her to to um, um, to respond, if she would, to one or two questions we've seen, and then we will have a short break. We'll have a five minute break just to give people a bit of a leg stretch. Um, so uh, one of the questions, or uh, some of the questions that have come up, minister, are about um, connectivity as a public utility and connectivity as a public good. And um, whether there's a, a possibility to move towards um, a, um, a situation where, where in poorer communities, the, the, um, the, the cost of the network isn't an obstruction for people connecting. And we've seen in some instances a zero rating, but whether the government has any plan to create um, 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 access as a, as a public good and a public utility and uh, free to people who can't afford it. So just if you could um, handle that, Minister, if you are still with us. Thank you so much uh, for that question. And of course, earlier on when I, I, I made my presentation, I made reference to the things that COVID has really exposed us to, which therefore meant that it really exposed us to those challenges of saying internet or connectivity is not a library. It's a basic need, just like electricity. And therefore, we believe that South, it is high time that South Africa treats it as such. That's why when I spoke about the second phase of SA Connect, I then mentioned the fact that the feasibility study that is being conducted seeks to, to look at wall-to-wall -wall connectivity. But amongst those, I spoke about the incentive that must therefore be, be, be availed by government to the private sector that must go and, and connect because we're not going to be providing different services to the people because of their geographical area. So if we're going to say we're deploying blockchain for particular uh, services, we're deploying artificial intelligence, it talks to the quality of the bandwidth that the people of South Africa must have, irrespective of whether they're in the suburbia or they're in the rural areas. If we are to digitize, for example, the health services, if we are to digitize education, we're not going to come up with different methodologies or, or software to say this one specifically uh, for the poor people, and therefore this is what we must do. But as we talk of that quality bandwidth, that should therefore be availed to all. We also saying there's a need to look at all because our responsibility is to enhance digital inclusion. And that starts by looking at those that are excluded or those that are digital outcasts, not by choice, but are forced by circumstances, whether it's issues of accessibility, or affordability, which is where government steps in. Uh, we will be, uh, unfortunately now, I can't detail the entire plan. As we said, we're looking into different studies that have been done to say how best can we go about. But one thing that we agree on is that internet is a basic human right as we stand. Therefore, government working with the private sector should find ways of ensuring that there's digital inclusion so that we, we really get everybody to participate in the in the digital economy. So we are looking at those without us being prescriptive was to appreciate the challenges that we face with. But there's certain areas where, for example, if you look at my department, when we work with USASA, currently as a rollout broadband, when we work with others, you see that 
we put more money on infrastructure. Actually, we subsidize infrastructure and you say it at the same time. Isn't it high time that we say, let's partner with the private sector to build infrastructure, whatever terms that we put and then government looks at usage. So those are the things that we are considering, uh, but the technical teams are working on the nitty gritty to say what would be the best method to ensure that there's going to be digital inclusion in South Africa. Uh, and as soon as we get that, that uh, those findings of the studies, then we'll be able to say this is the methodology that we're going to apply for South Africa. I hope I've answered your question. Madam Minister, thank, thank you very much for that answer. Um, I, I would just want to capitalize. I know you may have to drop off soon. There are two questions that I quickly want to sneak in before the break. One is a short one, which may have a long answer, but uh, I hope it may not be that long. Uh, the first one is, has there been any contact with Elon Musk's Starlink? Um, that's the first one. And um, maybe let me allow you to answer that, and then I'll, ans I'll ask you the, the, the last one. We, we had tried to, to, to get hold of, 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 of Elon Musk, uh, not only because of the work that he does. We recognize first that he's a South African, and therefore it also becomes our responsibility as we look into the mixed technologies, as we talk about connecting the people of South Africa to say, how can we build in some of, of, of his innovations? Uh, I know the Department of Trade and Industry is busy with that, and from our side, we have said we will wait for them and join that 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 they can they can agree on in terms of saying what are the other issues that we can collaborate on. But of course, key to that are the studies that are being conducted, and our our presidential PMO team is looking into that work to say what can be taken and the forecast is for South Africa. I hope I've answered. All right. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, so the last one from me, as I was saying, there were two. Uh, the, the question is, what is government's plan to share digital information platforms, i.e. fingerprints between the departments of Home Affairs, SAPS and banks, and, the, and minimize the reliance on hard copies, archives and physical copies that can be digitized and even cloud-based provided that the cyber security requirements are thoroughly, are thoroughly tested and implemented and maintained. Mouthful, I hope you could get it, the gist of it. Yes. Working with the Department of Public Service and Administration, uh, we are working on a process to digitize government services, starting by these basic things that you've spoken about. But of course, when it comes to the issue of the digital identity and all the other things that you're talking about, there we are working with the integrated justice cluster to say how can we first check, of course, there's the issue of, 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 of resources that we're taking into consideration. There's the policy issue that the department is busy with in terms of the data and cloud policy uh, to say as we, as we utilize all these platforms, we've got to ensure that there's residency of, of, of the data and therefore protection. And also the last thing that we're looking at are with the various departments that are in the security cluster even uh, is establishing a cyber security task force for South Africa to make sure that we can build firewalls and everything that must then enhance the security of the people that will be participating in the digital platforms that we are talking about. So we are in a process of making sure that we tighten the loose screws because if we do not do that as much as we are in a hurry to say let's get everybody on board in the digital platform but there's the issue of the skills that we have to look at and skills also take into consideration the do's and don'ts of participating in the net but at the same time they also talk to, 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 to that that matters most to say what can be done with the information that I provide in the internet and how safe is it because others as we say the, 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 the new oil in the fourth industrial revolution is the data how is that data used including this of ensuring security, as I said, as we talk about the fingerprints, which would help government plan better if we know that we don't have to be going through the same process from this office to that office. Last week at Tabang, we, we launched, um, we, we, we had a graduation of the data scientists, a program that we have started, partnered with different partners, will be rolling it out again uh, in a massified way with Coursera, well, we are saying because there's data that needs to be mined, the data from 1994 that is sitting at CETA needs to be mined and then processed, and it therefore informs not 
only government and its planning, but also the private sector and SMMEs. So those are the basic things that we say as we as we leverage on the new platforms, but let's also make sure that people can have trust and confidence in them. And key to that is to ensure that those are safe when they participate on the stage. Mm. Madam Minister, I hope you. you may still be able to hang around because there are a lot more questions your way. Um, however, if you have to go, we would understand. We would really appreciate if you could still, but I've been told we need to have a five minute break. Otherwise, uh, I, will, I will not be given my stipend for the day. So maybe if we can come back uh, at uh, uh, 10 to 2, uh, 1345, I mean, sorry, 1350. Uh, to resume uh, the, the questions and answer uh, series. Um, it will be appreciated. Uh, thank you very much. I would, I, I would uh, afford you that opportunity, but please take into consideration that now I'm on the road. I keep on getting cut, but I will stay with you. I'll keep on Thank trying. you. We really do appreciate that, ma'am. Thank you so much. It is uh, 13.50 um, on my watch. Uh, I hope you are back. Um, uh, just to say that um, the the uh, in, uh, the PowerPoint presentations that were done today and maybe the speeches, uh, we shall try also to circulate uh, to all uh, that have been in attendance. And uh, just thank you again for staying with us. Um, and I hope you have had an enjoyable leg like, stretch. Um, just uh, to continue with the questions, uh, Prof. Berry, would you want to take some over uh, for the minister? And then we can also spread it to the panel afterwards. Okay, I've got a question that's um, quite technical and um, someone's asking about when we'll see true 5G, um, uh, whether this will happen in 2021 um and uh, what our plans are in terms of the introduction of 5g and whether the minister or or possibly one of the other panelists can answer that does anyone want to pick up on that question very uh, have... very it's mark very it's mark i mean maybe just to come Yes. Right? So, so 5 G is directly related to spectrum uh, because 5 G exploits a certain amount of spectrum, and of course, the MNOs have a big play in the rollout once they have spectrum um, going forward. So, the, the minister has two things: we've got the the auction of the spectrum, which uh, is committed to happen this year, and then there's the wholesale access network, or known as the WON. Uh, which I think the minister said will happen in 2021. Um, 5G globally is is rolling out. Um, you know, it's not a magic magic wand that's going to get fixed immediately. It takes a while to roll out the types of uh, base stations, etc., to be able to exploit that that spectrum. And there's a commercial reality uh, around how fast even the MVNOs will roll out 5G. Uh, 5G initially in this market, so a lot of people also see it as being a cheaper way to do connectivity. It won't be that cheap initially. So as an example, if you look at RAIN, which is a good example, because they've already rolled out 5G, it's there. It's about 500 and something RAN per month for some level of connectivity. So there is a view that 5G will be everywhere. It will um, allow a faster rollout of connectivity to all uh, areas, but it will take a, a while longer. But the dependence on spectrum is going to determine how fast and how fast people make the investments in order to exploit the spectrum which they've been allocated. I hope that Thank handles you. the question. Thank you, Mark. Um, I just have a question that's um, kind of not really connected uh, to that, and it might be something to Lance, but it's a, uh, uh, um, it's a, a comment that starts by saying, in Mexico, broadband, broadband connectivity and access was enabled to rural areas and smaller towns by linking it to hospitals, clinics, police stations, post offices, and government offices. Uh, why? And the question is, why are we not following this model? 
and that probably touches on what CETA's plans are. So, so Prof, thanks for the question. It's a, it, it's a fundamentally important question. And uh, if we're brutally honest with ourselves, I, I think historically what we've done as government, and I speak in the broader sense, is that we've uh, acquired uh, solutions on a piecemeal basis. So uh, we would have, for that particular municipality, would have gone out for three or four sites. Um, at the same time, the police uh, station needs to be connected. The post office needs to be connected. So in essence, uh, what, what we've done historically, you put it onto market, market comes back, you have three or four different service providers. Um, the worst case scenario in rural and deep rural areas is that the telcos come back and say, well, we actually bid for this, but we've just done our commercial viability check. It doesn't stack up, so we're not going to provide the connectivity. So you go into an endless loop where you're not really provisioning, um, let's call it an enterprise grade solution to a locality, which then could become um, the enabling infrastructure to the communities that exist within um, close proximity to it. So, so what we are trying to do now, ACETA, and um, in fact, I've moved across into the infrastructure, uh, infrastructure services division just this, this month, is to start aggregating the demand and then taking a, a, a district or locality based approach to uh, putting our requirements out to market, uh, creating the incentives, as I've mentioned, to the aggregation of demand, and then creating that incentive for um, private sector to uh, invest their capital in that area and ensure that we have an extensible capability to then provide broadband, not only to the government sites, but then also uh, for me, but when I talk government sites, I'm now including schools, museums, libraries, um, community health centers. If we are able to address the requirement in that way, every time we provide connectivity to a government site, we are that much closer to a community close to that site. So within the Western Cape, where I happen to live, um, there are 1,300 schools that have uh, broadband connectivity. And in essence, uh, through the public Wi-Fi project being run by the province, uh, uh, the schools um, can access the, the Wi-Fi uh, from obviously the closest school. And, and that's partly to address the fact that uh, there, there's no point of access, that connectivity is expensive. And um, in fact, I, I uh, just earlier on messaged our uh, information security team so in the month of, so the biggest consumer of internet for the country are the schools in the Western Cape that are using, they've got a dedicated 5.5 gigabits per second link. Now, the only reason that uh, CETA can provide that to the Western Cape is that they, in essence, aggregated all schools and said CETA provide us connectivity to all of those schools, but we want corporate grade internet attached to that. So Prof, that's a long way of saying uh, the Mexican model is entirely appropriate. What it does require is joint and integrated planning. So if we then plan collectively as government, it's more likely that we address the supply and demand issues. And every time we connect a government site, we are that much closer to a community that we serve. Uh, so, so we're putting a lot of time, effort and energy into getting that right going forward. Lance, um while, whilst you're on the podium, uh, um, there's another question which I'm hoping you may be able to also touch on uh, in the absence of the minister. Um, I think she's now dropped off. Uh, it says the South African post office started in the early years developing, installing, maintaining and upgrading the telegram infrastructure services by the government at the time. What is government's involvement in ownership of, of the country's communication infrastructure? if not left to the private sector solely. Partnerships are great, but government should own and regulate, not only regulate and make life hard for the private sector. Uh, Tabang, I'm hoping there are going to be some easy questions at some point, <laughs> <laughs> but, I'll, but I'll take a stab at it. So once again, it's an, it's an excellent question. So, so think about it this way. Um, I think it was Arthur at the outset spoke about cloud and our cloud, uh, I think there were some statistics for Amazon, Microsoft and other, and our cloud demand has increased exponentially 
during the COVID pandemic. Now, so as CETA, we've invested very substantially in something uh, called the government platform ecosystem. And in essence, it's a cloud of cloud. What we say is that if, if a workload is secure, sensitive information, clearly we'd want as government to ensure, as the minister had mentioned, that the data residency issues are addressed and that we have that data in country, particularly if it's a patient record or a student record or information about a learner or somebody within the uh, social ecosystem. So, so the highly secure cloud, inevitably, we've spent a lot of time, effort and energy on architecture, security, and ensuring that it's on our infrastructure and in country. Everyone. If, if uh, as an example, yes. Yes. the uh, information is more of a commodity-based workload, um, so an email address that deals with um, non-proprietary information, okay. uh, then it's uh, quite likely that you want that yeah. you'd be quite happy for that information to exist to within a public cloud. So, so, so once again, I think if it's secure, um, a platform that okay. is required. Um, if it is, if we want to ensure that the information doesn't leave the country, that clearly their government probably wants to own and operate the infrastructure. More commodity-based workloads, um, there we could quite easily. Good afternoon, everyone. I'll just um, start by making a few points, and then I'll swap over to Kiru. So just the, the one point I want to make here is that Do you see? this is fine for now. Uh, can everyone see my, my screen? Uh, Lucy, please can you mute? Um, Johnny, can you mute Lucy, Lucy's call? Yes, we can see. I'm sorry, Lance. Uh, Prof, I, th I thought it was just a voice in my head. <laughs> um, so, so, so I think just to, to um, summarize that, I, I think there are certain workloads that we'd want to function within the government ecosystem. There are others that are commodity based workloads, as if it's just cheap storage that you require for non sensitive information. There's no reason why a public cloud provider can't uh, provide that. We are engaging very closely with the state security agency, obviously. Um, all cloud-based workloads we need to ensure uh, meet uh, the, the requirements as set out and the SSA are the custodians of that due diligence. Uh, so uh, when we start talking Microsoft, uh, Amazon and other, uh, that's at, at quite an advanced stage of being vetted already. Um, I, I must say, the, the, the challenge in fact is that obviously if I'm owning and operating my infrastructure, the cost for that unit of whatever I'm selling is that much higher. So you then get the economies of scale of uh, whatever a Microsoft or an Amazon could acquire that unit of whatever it is that you're consuming at. And government has become very price sensitive. So I think the, the need for securing um, information, running it on a, sec a secure platform, and the cost of external providers perhaps to providing alternatives, the, 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 it's gotta be about a value proposition um, consideration that also needs to be made. Um, could I step in with a question, and it might be to Arthur or to Mark, but uh, there's a question that says um, something about um, the key word in what uh, Lance presented was a self-sustaining self ecosystem. And the question talks about local manufacture. And I know Arthur has looked at uh, devices and, and sort of end user electronic and um, the, the question is about uh, tablets and smartphones and other devices and uh, whether that's happening locally and to what extent. And then going uh, further into the network, whether things like our um, uh, the um, um, network switches and uh, 5G equipment is being manufactured locally. We're hearing that a lot of money is being spent on rolling out broadband and connectivity and whether that's being used to benefit local industry and, and manufacturing. So that's the question. I don't know whether Arthur wants to come in and talk about the devices. I'd be happy to talk about it briefly, Barry. There have been various efforts to manufacture uh, locally, but manufacture is perhaps a misnomer. It's more like assembling locally, bringing in the parts from Chinese factories that mass manufacture, 
and then assembling them locally. Very often the parts are uh, customized in these Chinese factories and shipped out here, but mostly from a branding point of view. Generally speaking, it's a case of using reference designs that companies like Qualcomm and MediaTek provide, and you can then uh, fine tune or customize um, what you're going to put together, but based on what's already being manufactured, and then you import that in bulk and assemble it locally. So Mint was one of the forerunners in that kind of approach, and today you have Mara phones who claim they're manufacturing locally um, as well. The problem with all of those is that they don't have the economies of scale that you get with the bigger brands, like a Transient, for example, that uh, sells the Technophone, Techno brand across uh, Africa. Um, they are also manufactured in China. It's perceived as an African brand uh, because it's designed for this market. And because they come <laughs> so many markets and they have the volumes, they achieve the um, economies of scale as well. But purely South African manufacture and even assembly doesn't really get there. So you get a, a lower spec phone for a higher price if they're manufactured locally as opposed to the internationally sourced ones. And it's all very well to talk about the need to create a local manufacturing capacity, but it's a global phenomenon. There are very few countries that have local manufacture of those kind of high tech uh, devices. So it's a bit of a fantasy to want to create a local manufacturing industry around something that is being manufactured at such massive scale and at such incredible economies of scale in those giant uh, markets. Thank you. Yeah. And um, I just wonder whether Mark can comment on the um, network equipment manufacture. Is that happening locally? Was that the same as what we're hearing from Arthur? So, so I think Arthur's uh, hit the nail on the head, Barry. It's extremely difficult just because we just don't have the scale here and we haven't reached uh, a point of a manufacturing production environment where we can compete. Uh, we've seen as an example, there's been an initiative in the Eastern Cape uh, to manufacture. Uh, I think it started off with decoders and try to get into smartphone and tablets. Very difficult to make it work when you're competing against the Chinese and the Indians and some of the other Asian countries where the cost of labor and the best practices from a manufacturing is already inculcated at, at scale within the, the environment. Uh, when you look at the networking equipment, we, you know, we, we, we occasionally there's a gem that comes out locally, but it's very, very far in, in between. Even on the software side, which is probably a little bit easier than the hardware manufacturing, uh, what we will see is that it's hard for South Africa to compete. One, just because of the investment required um, and the ability, do we really have that type of software skills which can develop the type of applications that will be uh, prominent in the networking space? But it's something the country has to keep go doing, right? We just have to keep doing. We really, uh, a lot of the, the digital stuff is a, uh, consumer based economy uh, to say we have to import just about everything and it does make it expensive and more difficult for us to be successful. And it's something I think government has to put incentives behind industry has to stand up and look at what we can do locally and then drive that forward. But right now, a very low percentage of the networking or the access devices uh, actually come from local environment. And South Africa also very brand proud, I can call it, right? So, you know, if you look at uh, some of the other countries like India and China, uh, they they don't necessarily go for big Western brands and some of the cheaper local brands uh, are attractive to them, which is not where we are. If you don't have an Apple or Samsung, you're not worth it at the moment. Mm -hmm. Yes, unfortunate. Yeah. Um, prof, there's, uh, there's a, a very long question, but I think it's worth asking here from Ray, Rayfield Wright. He says, I work for a group that is constructing agriculture collective, and um, sorry, that is a constructing an agriculture collect in the Northwest province, whereby we are targeting an initial class of 300 pupils. Our primary objective will be to provide a curriculum that will be based on the approved South African norms 
but through partnerships here and abroad. We hope to employ some of the technologies highlighted by your presenters to enable the school to go beyond these established norms and provide for a paradigm shift in the type and quality of the education our students will uh, experience, who undoubtedly will be nearly 100% previously disadvantaged individuals. Now the question, what advice could any of your panelists suggest as we must have uh, as, as a must have to create the kind of learning experience to help in genuinely transforming the agri sector? And he says, thank you. The long one, the question is the end. Uh, what advice could you or any of the panelists uh, suggest as a must to have to create the kind of learning experience to help in the genuine transforming transformation of the agri set. It, uh, it, it is to all of you. <laughs> Barry, I was hoping Lance will respond to that one, but <laughs> I, I'm, I'm happy to give it a go. So let's, so, 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 I'm, I'm mulling it over. You take a first step. <laughs> OK. So, 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 so first of all, when you look at a school of 300 people, it's less of an issue that government faces from a broad based education issue, right? So connectivity is where you start and do you have connectivity to that school? And there are different options about how you can connect a school of 300 pupils. Uh, they, there's, you know, there's an example uh, different, there's wireless, there's, there's all types of connectivity. Uh, options that you can do to create connectivity to the school. The second thing are the platforms, uh, specifically around the e-learning. Not too difficult. There's lots of them, even some local ones. Uh, it's a matter of the choice of platform that's suitable to the environment. The third for the agri sector is going to be around content. What is the content that will have a meaningful impact on a school like that to develop the types of uh, content that will help them uh, to progress? The fourth and the fifth is basically the lecturers and the teachers do not be, be left behind and making sure that the learners are computer literate. So it, it's not a difficult formula if it's only the 300 schools, but the overall agricultural sector, I have to give hand over to Lance because that's more in his domain. Uh, thanks, Mark. And, and I think that's really, so, so I think it was the Northwest that we, we were referring to. And I, uh, so, so when I was still responsible for provinces within CETA, um, I probably in the course of the two years, only got through to the Northwest four or five times. And I was always struck by the fact that, so, so you've got a conceptual view of rural and deep rural, uh, but when you're out on the road for four, five, six hours, and you realize the geographic spread of our people and where people are located and the difficulty in getting meaningful infrastructure out there, uh, it, it really, uh, it's a difficult problem statement. And I think uh, to, to, to give a very high level response, I think firstly, uh, agriculture, I think it was one of the panel members early on today, um, Dr. Adams, I think that mentioned that agriculture is such a fundamentally important sector for the country. And perhaps the point of departure is to, to uh, and I unfortunately I just don't understand the Northwest well enough, uh, but uh, either within the education department or you may even find that the provincial department of agriculture they typically have initiatives uh, where they uh, focus particularly on skills development agriculture has been quite innovative so agriculture has taken it to the extent where they at some point created something called the agrinet which was to provide connectivity utilizing uh, just about everything other than fiber to provide um, connectivity to their constituents so, so I think as a point of departure, um, but, but as I say, I'm just not too familiar with the Northwest to approach either the agriculture department within the province or alternatively a combination of agriculture and education, because there may very well be something in flight that you can leverage on. Um, and then, of course, civil society, where I, I think they, we, we mustn't underestimate the 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 role that uh, society plays within uh, our community. So perhaps there's a, a forum or an entity that's already been established or created that you can leverage on. Uh, but profile, I'll look into that and see if I can't find some information and perhaps just uh, if we do have a, a contact um, 
email address, I can try and to source the information and provide that. Thank you. Thank you, Lance. Um, a question that's uh, come up, and this is as well to the whole panel, is that we, we're speaking very enthusiastically about increasing connectivity further and further, but, uh, but it um, comes with a risk as well around cybersecurity. And as more and more people are connected, we're more and more uh, dependent on security of our networks. Does anyone want to comment on cybersecurity and how we ensure or strengthen that? So, so uh, Prof, while, while um, the panel members are thinking about it, I think uh, let, let me approach it perhaps from a government perspective. Um, and perhaps the panel members can approach it uh, broader than that. So, so uh, from a CETA perspective, once again, because we are um, responsible for the, the government network and a lot of the government websites and information that we are the custodians of, uh, we obviously take um, security and cyber security very seriously. Uh, we investing substantially in CETA in terms of um, uh, upgrading and in fact at, uh, uh, advancing our security operation center. Uh, it's in fact something that uh, within the next uh, few uh, weeks, we, if we've not done so already, we'll, we'll be engaging with industry to identify best practices and utilize that to inform uh, the approach that we will take to um, supplement and complement our uh, SOC capability um, that we provide on behalf of government. Um, the, the minister did mention early on also that there are uh, broader initiatives um, in place, uh, we, I think it was a cyber security task force that she mentioned. Um, the, the risks attached to the virtualized world that we now exist in are serious. I, I think a number of the um, uh, colleagues that are on the call would have heard about Zoom calls being intercepted for parliament and uh, there was a big database leak where just about all of our personal information has been made publicly available by one of the uh, credit uh, companies. So, so it's top of mind. Uh, we are CETA obviously focusing on the government uh, side of it. Uh, just to supplement that, I think also from a change management and capacitation perspective, I think it's all well and good going back to the point I made about getting the infrastructure out there, but we do need to capacitate and skill up our people to understand fully the risks attached with living in a virtual world. Uh, but that, that covers primarily the public sector side. Um, could I just maybe uh, direct this question? And um, I know a couple of years ago, Arthur, you did a lot of work on uh, cyber security. And I think uh, last year I heard you talk about um, some research you had done on security. Is that still something that you are following? And have you got any comments or suggestions on cybersecurity? We look largely at the readiness of organizations for a cyber breaches, cyber attacks and the like. And we look at it from the perspective of uh, the organization itself and its, uh, its uh, culture around security rather than specific technical approaches. And what we find generally speaking is that those organizations where cybersecurity is part of business strategy, an integral part of business strategy, and not just a bolt on or an afterthought or something that's delegated, but where the, uh, the board or the executive level takes full responsibility for it, those organizations are the most effective in protecting themselves. Where it's left to the IT department, there's a misalignment between IT and uh, management or IT and business or IT and the organization. So the organizational goals have to be supported by uh, IT and by security rather than IT simply being a layer that underlies the, uh, the, the business processes. And uh, that is that has come through in quite a few of our research projects. We did uh, a survey of more than 300 uh, chief financial officers in South Africa and we found that one of the most significant shifts in their role is uh, to work with IT in supporting uh, the uh, business goals that are driven by the CEO 
but the CEO, um, the CFO and the CIO no longer work in silos in an effective organization that is. So where they still work in silos, that's where the organizations remain more uh, vulnerable. That's really the bottom uh, line. If the CIO is trying to run an empire, he in effect is um, rendering the organization as a whole uh, vulnerable. So um, the, there was a question um, that uh, I thought was quite basic and, and which, which still need to be answered. Um, it's unfortunately by Anonymous, but Anonymous is asking, how can digital communication become more affordable and accessible to poor people living in cities? So, uh, and so, it, is, it, it is to the yeah, panel, yeah. yeah. Mm. So, so I'll take a first stab at that. No, inevitably we then need to explore that cross subsidization model. Um, and because it is something that I'm, I'm quite familiar with, I, I think once again, uh, let's assume, um, and I'm just looking at some of the, 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 the Q&A, so I'm going to give a, unfortunately, a Western Cape centered answer, and then I'm going to try and uh, broaden it out a little bit. So, so within the, the Western Cape, once the 2000 corporate sites were connected, in essence, every one of those 2000 sites then became a public Wi-Fi hotspot. But the benefit of that is that, in essence, you've already got the, the last mile addressed. You've got um, uh, corporate grade internet attached to that. And then by prov uh, providing a, let's call it an access point on a separate virtual private network, which is public facing, uh, you then inevitably can utilize what government is already in the, the sites are already connected. So there's a nominal additional charge for providing internet connectivity and then of course you, you've got a charge attached to an access point. So in essence you can then lower the price of entry for the, uh, whether it's a resident, whether it's somebody sitting in a hospital that wants to go into the public Wi-Fi, uh, ideally you'd want them to check the, the patient record rather than uh, being on Twitter or Facebook necessarily. But, but inevitably, then you are able to pass through a saving through to the consumer. So in that case, once the, that citizen had used up, let's say, their 500 megs of data for the month, there was then a charge of 59 Rand for the next 500 megs. So there are different models that can be utilized. But once again, 59 Rand may not be a lot of money for somebody within the Cape Town CBD, but it's an extraordinary amount of money for somebody out in stress by living in a fishing village, as an example. So everything is relative. Um, I, I did see, um, Tabang, if you can just allow me, there was a question saying, but yeah, that worked in the Western Cape. Uh, what about the other provinces? I think it's important to note that uh, we're following the very same model now in the Eastern Cape, where we're taking that aggregation of demand model, uh, trying to get as far into the, the rural and deep rural areas, and then ultimately we'll work with the Eastern Cape Provincial Government to saw, see how we can open that network up. Uh, that's uh, come up and it's uh, looking at um, and it it it, it uh, kind of touches on the same thing that Lance has just spoken to, but we've heard about metropolitan broadband or free Wi-Fi in cities. So I know uh, Joburg, Pretoria, various uh, cities have tried to go for free Wi-Fi hotspots. Would that be a um, solution to providing free access to people within our cities? And uh, where are we with those initiatives? Uh, Mark, maybe you want to, uh, you might. Yeah, know so, something. so Barry, there's multiple approaches to this. I, I think the free Wi Fi is difficult to make it work. You can use uh, thing, post offices and libraries and and schools and make it available through free Wi-Fi or government offices, and that will help to enable a community. I think, however, if you look deeper, um, you know, when a kid has to do education, you can't expect them to go sit outside a library and do e-learning or video conferencing from that environment. It's the, it's it's just impractical. There are community driven initiatives which i hope government is looking for new entrants 
into the actual connectivity space. And as that becomes more prevalent, what you will find is that as an example, I've seen recently a company which is doing something they call we, they call it WISP in technology, which is a, a, a Wi-Fi ISP or wireless ISP. And the innovations that's happening globally is fantastic, right? Where uh, communities are actually looking, they're putting in microwave links, they're creating a Wi-Fi so that you don't have to necessarily dig into the ground or create the actual last mile physically. It's wireless and suddenly con uh, communities are able to afford uh, connectivity because someone in the community had an initiative to create their own uh, Wi-Fi environment in that uh, environment. Uh, this private LTE which is going out, but to do that government is going to have to enable it through the regulation. So even the issue around who gets spectrum, the spectrum is a major driver of where you don't need fiber. You can put in some uh, microwave, micro link type so solutions into community areas, then enable wire, wireless ISP, uh, ISPs to become more prevalent. So you're almost creating a free economy in that space. Before it was ex extremely difficult to do because the cost of anyone trying to play on top of a telco's uh, capability or connectivity, the margins were just so small. In the rest of the world, we're starting to see just this rush, people creating their community LTs, people creating their own uh, free Wi-Fi within communities and being afforded by the community. And I think in South Africa, as those entrepreneurs start coming through, as those new companies start to come through, new uh, small companies start to come through. I think you see a change in the amount of innovation and the affordability drop to be able to connect people. So there's no one answer. I think there's multiple answers. I think uh, the, the role of government in creating public Wi-Fi is one. I think you will see the rollout and new entrants, especially as 5G becomes more prevalent. I think you will start to see new entrants into this particular space and you'll see these things called wireless ISP start to emerge and make it affordable and being able to reach all areas. Again, the problem we will have, probably have, it will be metro focused and more difficult in the rural areas just because of the backbones not necessarily being there, but that will evolve as well as people start to solve that problem. Um, Tabang, maybe you want to um, send out the last question. I see we're coming to 2.30. Is there time for one more question? Uh, I I didn't pick one, Prof. I was about uh, waiting for you to summarize and for yeah. us to close. Yeah. I think that we, we, we clearly have a lot more questions than we've answered, but I think we've touched on a lot of the themes that have come up. So we are now um, approaching 2.30 and we uh, will close at 2.30. It's uh, been very interesting for me just to to hear the the uh, breadth of the discussion. So the the question we posed in this um, in um, today's webinar was um, affordable and accessible uh, broadband for everyone. So to to really try and make it that that every South African citizen has access to the kind of connections that Lucy spoke about, where people can do streaming and education and, and entertainment and work from home. And we um, clearly heard from the minister that we that there are gaps, that there's this digital divide. And we heard that um, government has plans in place and is working towards closing those gaps. Uh, we heard um, some of the, the statistics and some of the, the detail from Arthur, who stressed as well how important connectivity is. Um, uh, we then went on to Lucy, who gave um, a very practical example of how in an educational uh, project in uh, Saldana Bay, th they are striving towards achieving and closing this gap and achieving the kind of thing we should be trying to achieve. And then from Mark, we heard about uh, how um, 
and um, um, are wearing a corporate hat, but how there's a lot of work going on, but the gaps are enormous. The, we shouldn't kid ourselves that this is going to be easy to do. And I think the same view coming from Lance, from the uh, government space. So we, we see the problem and we are beginning to see solutions, but there's still a lot of work to do. I think this has been a very valuable contribution to pulling the, the different stakeholders together and hopefully finding solutions that we can work. If there's one word that that is epitomized in this uh, webinar and in the discussion, it's about partnership. It's about everyone working together. It's not your problem. It's not my problem. It's not their problem. It's our problem. And I think that that it's not about and I saw a comment on the uh, questions and, and it'll be my closing remark. Um, somebody said, let's stop speaking about the cost and let's start speaking about the benefit and the benefit of having every South African connected will be so enormous that that we shouldn't pause to think about what it will cost, but look at how we benefit. So thank you everyone. A big thank you to the panelists. A thank you to Ned Bank. A thank you to uh, Chris Yellen, my partner in planning this, and to the team, to um, Johnny, who's been working feverishly in the background, making it all work well. So uh, thank you very much and to the listeners. Uh, uh, please um, keep track and there'll be more of these coming up. If I can just hand back to Taban. Thank you very much, Prof. And ladies and gentlemen, we have reached the end of our session today. We have been blessed to have the minister address us and lay the foundation for the discussion. And we have had some uh, uh, from some dynamic panelists as you've heard from the professor uh, explaining what they've been saying. So the sense I also have been left with uh, from all the discussion is the one about collaboration. We have been pushed into an era of collaboration between the public, private and all of us for us to win as a country and to be internationally competitive. I wish to invite you again to the next session, which would be on the Thursday, 15th of October at uh, 20, I mean, uh, Thursday, 15th October this year, of course. And the topic then will be the independent grid company as an enabler to diversity and efficiency. The independent grid company as an enabler to uh, for for diversity and efficiency the seminar will explore how an independent state-owned transmission grid company can facilitate non-discriminatory access to the grid on level playing fields and on economic grounds this is seen as the key to attracting investment extracting efficiencies mitigating risks and creating new jobs in a diversified and competitive generation sector. So as we've said earlier, um, the material will be made available to all of you who have subscribed and uh, um, have been on the, the, same, the webinar um, and the recording of, of this session as well. I wish to thank you all uh, for your time and to the esteemed panel. Thank you again for giving off your time to be with us until we see each other on the 15th of October. Cheers. <laughs>